On tonight's episode of the Online Wine Tasting Club, Alex gets excited, perhaps even a bit poetic for once about a plant that doesn't grow grapes. Jamie starts fanboying over getting to interview a real live master of wines. You are our first MW on any of these tastings, so that's that's really exciting. We find out where these people dressed in white are going. It's time to learn all about one of the coolest wine regions in the world with the adventurous series, Rioja Masterclass. A very good evening to you and a warm welcome on a really, really chilly night tonight. We were we had a bit of snow and sleet here earlier, but um, I know not a lot less than some parts of the country have been having, and certainly a heck of a lot less than they've been having in northern Spain, which has been under like six feet of snow. It's been quite unprecedented. The, the, the rain in Spain may stay firmly on the plain, but uh, the snow has been hitting previously untouched regions of the country. So, But we are going to be going to Rioja tonight and we're going to be doing our first ever masterclass. Now we thought we would call upon somebody, um, a real expert, who's actually got their diploma from the Rioja Wine Academy to, to come along. So I'd like to introduce you to Jamie. Oh, thank you very much. Um, no, good evening everybody and welcome. I know there's a, a lot of people joining us for the first time, so thank you very much. For those of you who have been with us before, we say masterclass. It's not so scary. It's still me. Um, and he, he says, I've got this diploma from the Rocker Wine Academy. That was my first lockdown project. I'm like, well, sat down, thought I'd do a little bit of learning, so, so did this diploma. Um, but what we've got today is we're going to do a little bit of a deeper dive in things. We're going to not get technical and over the top, but we're going to do a little bit more into um, you know the wine and what it tastes like and why it tastes like it tastes. Um, just for the sheer fact, as we've done a few of these, um, people on this adventurous level have said, we like the geeky yeah. stuff, we want the techie stuff. So we want once to do again, our tasting journals, so we've got gets, one of those here. Once again, if it gets too techie, <clears throat> tell us it's too techie. If it's not techie enough, tell us it's not techie enough. But on this one, we like to do lots of live things, but we, I keep saying but, I need to stop saying but. Um, we got access to some really, really cool winemakers. We got some access to some, you know, our first master of wine, which I got really excited about. And we thought if we're going to do this deep dive into Rioja, who better than to give us the information than, you know, the people who are touching the wine day in, day out themselves. So we've got three interview videos today. They do last a little bit longer than normal because what we're doing is we're doing the two wines side by side um, for the red. So we're going to start with a white Rioja. We're then going to do two reds that come from single vineyard plots. To get two glasses, two make glasses. sure you've got two glasses. For and the, then for our final yeah. segment, we're going to do two Riochas that have different ageing standards when we talk about uh, Reserva, Grand Reserva, that kind of stuff. And then old winemaker buddy, old pal here, has um, written some poetry or quoted some poetry or something and is going to tell us all about oak um so let's get wine number one in the glass because yep. that's what Sounds we're here good. for um but for for those of you who have um have joined us on 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 a membership you may well have received one of these little little tasting pads here and we've got a lovely little photo that we can pop up because you can't see what i'm what i'm putting here um so something like that and alex has attempted to write what we're tasting so this is one of the wines we're doing a little bit later on but what you can see here is you can pop the name of the wine in you know the color whether it's you know ruby purple whatever it is you know whether it's white it's that kind of color so this the idea here is to write your own tasting notes in here we will go through the wines we'll tell you what we taste and stuff like that but we sometimes feel that if we go ahead and give the tasting notes too early people just kind of go oh i agree with that i know what that is or oh, i don't quite oh jamie said blackberry so it must be blackberry so we're here to answer whatever question you want but we want you to kind of guide the tasting yourself we're going to have our, our regular questions our regular bit of fun um but i think i'm talking a little well, bit well i mean much. i'm have just going to quickly to say the other thing that's probably really good uh, I'm, I'm, I'm mike wazowski here the little diagram that's in the bottom right corner which is we call the wine compass this is where you can give a score for your wine for de- different characteristics now maybe jamie will explain what typicity means and uh, um you know uh, some things like this how do you tell if it's high body or high acidity um, how can you tell exactly what the tannins are? And some of the, what the 
winemakers go a little bit geeky on the, the tannins a bit later. But um, yeah, you end up with this little bit of a shape, which can just tell you at a glance. Oh yeah, I remember that was that one which had a really zinging acidity, but actually not 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 high alcohol. And um, yeah, so so it's a, just look at it at a glance. But let's let's crack open wine number one and um, find out a little bit about about what makes Rioja Rioja. And um, so yes, yeah, yeah, so our next video. video is our intro to Rioja and then the interview with Lewis Canyas. So get your Cheers. wine open and we'll see you in a few minutes. Cheers. As of all the wine regions of the world, Rioja is up there with the very best. Enjoyed globally, inexpensive bottles of Rioja can be incredible value. You can find them everywhere and they're reliable and versatile. They just work with so many different kinds of foods or equally on their own. But what we're hoping to show you tonight is that Rioja is not one thing. There is so much variety available, and the premium ones can almost be a life-changing wine experience. Rioja is Spain's leading wine region, and they make predominantly rich red wines. Only 7-8% of the production is white, and 2% rosé. Let's start with a touch of history. Now, the region gets its name from the river, or Rio Oja. Rio Oja, Rioja. You see what they did there? The Oje itself is a tributary of the Ebro, which ends up in the Mediterranean near Barcelona. As in much of the country, winemaking goes back to Roman times. The earliest wines made here at the time were thought to be mostly light, with very little character, most likely a blend of grapes from the relatively cool north of the country. But it's only been in recent decades that their top wines started being held in the same regards as some of the best of Italy or France. Over the following centuries, the Carthaginians and then the Romans developed all the winemaking techniques across Spain. But when the Moors took over in the 8th century, creating the stunning Arabic-inspired architecture that dominates so many Spanish cities, a general decline in winemaking started. And it didn't start to recover until the Reconquista of Spain 400 years later. Because of its heat, Spain was very good at making higher alcohol wines, as well as the eventual advent of fortified wines such as sherry. This allowed the wines to travel well, and Spain began a tradition of exporting that continues to this day. That led to massive expansion during the 17th and 18th centuries to Spain's colonies. In the second half of the 19th century, Spanish winemakers boomed, as France's vineyards had been decimated by the bug phylloxera. French winemakers went as far as buying in Spanish wine in bulk to bottle in France, something that even continues today, much to the annoyance of the southern French winemakers. But 160 years ago, it was the French winemakers who crossed the border and brought with them more advanced winemaking techniques, which greatly improved the quality of Spanish wine, especially in Rioja. Following this, many experts moved on from Spain to seek their fortunes elsewhere in the world. Those who stayed replanted and changed the face of the vines grown. Countless old varieties were lost in favour of more uniform and more productive selections, such as those used in Carver. Things were going well, too well. Along came war. First, the Spanish Civil War, and then almost immediately afterwards, World War II. Naturally, this impacted the wine production, and things went downhill badly. It wasn't until the second half of the 20th century that another quality revolution started. The vintage of 1970 put Rioja and Spain back on the map of the wine world. After the death of dictator Franco in 1975, winemakers started to introduce more scientific and clean winemaking. New, young, globally educated winemakers have transformed the scene completely. The consistent quality of these new wines has led to Spain being one of the top three wine producers in the world. But in addition to the ability to produce lots of wine, every year we see more singular, iconic wines emerging, showing that Spain is readily capable of finesse in addition to creating well-priced wine for the masses. So where and what defines Rioja? The Denominación de Origen Calificada Rioja is located in the north of Spain, stretching along the banks of the Upper Ebro. It's about 60 miles south of Bilbao, or as we might say, the Bay of Biscay, and about 240 miles west of the mouth of the Ebro on the Mediterranean. A few technicalities. Rioja is not exclusively identified with the autonomous community of La Rioja, rather it's a wine region spread across three regions, La Rioja itself, the Basque Country and Navarre. So, Rioja refers to the DOCA, while La Rioja refers to just the autonomous community. The official area has 66,000 hectares of vineyard. Putting that into perspective, Rioja is around half the size of Bordeaux, but nearly three times the size of Burgundy. 
Rioja is protected from the cold, wet Atlantic northerly winds by the Sierra de Cantabria mountains and from the extreme climate of the central plateau by the Sierra de la Demanda and Sierra de Cameros. It's crossed by the Ebro, which is one of the largest rivers in Spain, flowing from the west to the east, whose tributaries form seven valleys, each with particular climates and soils. The river runs close to the northern border of the wine region, forming a narrow fringe with rugged terrain, while the seven tributaries, including the Oja and Letha, run south, forming their respective valleys. Barely a hundred kilometers, but 200 meters in altitude, separate the westernmost town, Haro, from the easternmost, Alfaro. Most of the vineyards are planted on terraces, and some grow as high up as 800 metres. It's not a ski resort, but that still makes a huge difference. The region itself is tiny compared to the diversity of soils and microclimates, which can give wines really unique traits. Coupled with the different grape varieties permitted and the growing techniques, a huge range of wines with massive difference in personalities are possible within the framework of Rioja. So why do we all think of Rioja as one thing? How can we just pick up a Rioja and say, I know what this will taste like, it'll work great with a leg of lamb? Well, all the geography shapes Rioja as a unique land, one which enjoys the necessary conditions to produce high quality wines from grapes that have the potential for intensity, acidity and superb tannins. But tonight, we're going to have some fun. We're going to look at the differences between white and red Riochas, Riochas from single vineyard sites from different regions, and then Riochas with some time in oak versus Riochas that have spent a lot of time in oak. We're also going to do a deep dive into what oak actually means for wine, so there's a lot to talk about. But first, we're going to visit Bodega Luis Cañas, who made this delicious wine number one, and find out a little about this fourth generation family winery and how to make a white Rioja. Hi Oscar. Chris. How are you doing? Very well and you? Yeah, very well, thanks. Very well. Uh, we are we are family winery. Um, we became a big winery in, in 1970 by the hand of uh, Luis Cañas. Uh, Luis Cañas, uh, he was uh, a very important uh, person in, in Rioja, La Vesa, where we are located in 1970. As I was saying, he used to produce the carbonic maturation, so typical, so popular. In this in this area, and the winery make a turn a very huge turn in 1989 when Juan Luis Cañas, Luis Cañas son, came around, came back to the winery, and he started to produce Crianza, Reserva, Grand Reserva wines, uh, our white wines, always you know struggling, fighting with uh, his daddy mm -hmm. because uh, two different generations. Uh, it's always very difficult to understand each other. Yeah, uh, we we usually remember the way Luis Cañas used to. To say to, to Juan Luis, uh, why are you going to produce a white wine? Nobody produces it around here. Well, that's, that's why. And we got such a lovely white grapes, varieties. So, well, uh, Juan Luis Cañas is a very hardworking man. Uh, we had another two wineries now in Spain. Uh, one is called Amarin, what means from the mother in Basque country. Now it's managed by Young Cañas, our third generation. Okay. So, uh, we are very proud to, to have him around. He's uh, now 34 years old, producing another lovely brand of different wines, always producing the wines from the, from the vineyard. Uh, we, we really believe you have to produce the wine depending on the vineyard, it's depending on the wine you're really going to produce. So it's very important for us, the age of the, of the vineyards, the type of soil. We've got uh, around 14 different types of soils in our area. And we are in Rio Jalavesa, what is the smallest of the three areas. But uh, we've got a very um, different type of weather. Uh, we are protected by the mountains, by the Sierra, Sierra Cantabria. I don't know if you can see it at the back. Uh, we've got a quite the snow now. Um, and the Ebro River, that makes many difference of, uh, of weather during the day and during the night. So in order to produce a, a lovely uh, balance with the uh, ripeness, in, in our varieties, uh, it's such a great area. And also in this area is where you're gonna find much more slopes, terrace, all of them. So it's, it's very important for us. We, in Luis Cañas, we've got 1,120 different plots because it's a very small type of plots. And just yep. to make you an idea, uh, the average plot we've got around is 4,000 meters, square meters. That's pretty small in this area. Um, because of the um, heritage in the old times, uh, families used to, to split between different uh, daughters and sons. 
So that makes very small different plots, but that's our treasure. Now with the, um, the change of climate, it became very popular to plant in the slopes of the mountains. That was forbidden uh, 25 years ago. Okay. In some areas in Rioja, we probably going to have the, um, the same weather than Toledo. Toledo is the south of Madrid. So we have to consider now what type of, of clones, of varieties, of plots we really want to produce in, in the next 30, 50, 80 years. We quite like organic agriculture, but we, we don't have any label about that. Uh, everything must be done by hand, but not using copper or uh, not using sulfur, it's, oof, it's a trouble. It's a very hard work for the viticulture department team natural components but we really have to change this every year but it takes a lot of a lot of work so we produce our our whites from for many years ago but we always uh, wanted to try a different way to produce uh, our whites varieties we are so proud to to have such a lovely amazing very old viewers the viewer is such an interesting variety you can bury the you can ferment it in barrel the the crianza, you can keep it with the leaves. And now there's a, a new age of uh, white briojas all around, all around this area. Uh, we really love the classic style, but we prefer to produce the, the new style, the new age of uh, our whites. So always trying to preserve the pretty, the variety, and trying to consider the terroir as the most important uh, feeling you have to, to get in your nose and in your palate, you know. T tell me a bit more about that in terms of, in terms of um... Uh, how the grapes are grown, which which of these um, plots they're from, um, uh, and also then how it's dealt with in the in the winery too. Well, we we used to produce a barrel fermented uh, uh, white wine from Luscanias, but we wanted to to make something much more modern in our new white, uh, the Luscanias Viñas Viejas or Vineyard or vines. Uh, we produce a, a wine with a 85, 90 percent, depending on the year of Viura. The Macabeo in other areas in Spain and also in France, and the Malvasia, the Mamsi. But the Mamsi in Rioja, it's a synonym. It's not the Mamsi we know from Madeira or no. from Lazio. Okay, it's a different variety, absolutely different variety. Actually, here, uh, the, the, the viticultors, they used to call it Rojal, reddish, because it turns some red color. Uh, it hasn't got the terpenic, you know, the aromas of the roses or. or or tropical fruits. No, no, not at all. It's very, very citrus. Um, with the Vura, it blends so well. In the way of the Vura, it gives the paddy. Uh, we have it in contact, in contact with the leaves for between five, seven months, depending, depending on, on the year. And the vineyard comes from three different towns around Villabuena. The most important part of it, obviously, is Villabuena de Alaba, where we are. Uh, uh, Navaridas and Leza. Uh, the largest distance of the vineyards to the winery are four kilometers. They are very old vines, so they don't really produce very much. And what is most important is where, where are they planted? They are planted in the top of the hills of the vineyard. Because of the ventilation, white varieties go very well in order to avoid any illness, any treatment, and that area usually is much more limestone type of soil that's why we want to preserve that kind of aromas and the high acidity that remains it, does it, is it still barrel aged to an extent yeah yeah i love that question because we it's like a puzzle you know we got with a different type of plots we have part of it in 225 little barrels another part in 500 little barrels uh, in this case it's 70 francs and 30 american Okay. Most of them are, are not very toasted, not charmed. Another part we've got in concrete, eggs. Uh, in there we do the fermentation and then the aging uh, with the lease, in contact with the lease. And finally, eventually, we do the blended. We want to uh, improve the aroma, the fillings the, in the palate. Uh, like uh, I used to say, like salt and pepper in food, you know, uh, eating. Increase the flavor, but if you pass over, it's going to be too much. So we want to keep that line, you know. Excellent. And, and, and flavor profiles with uh, your old vine white. Um, 
you're often getting uh, a bit of a sort of honeyed element to it, um, uh, but maybe sort of nutty as well. That will be in the next five, six years, I think. Yeah, okay. Uh, now you, you got that kind of touch because of the contact with the list, but even in the future, it's gonna be more and more. It's like now, some apple, some, some type of, uh, of melon. Uh, I really love the lemon, the lemon aromas, the, the zest aromas from the mouth, say, for example. Um, aromas, they really come from the barrels, but they don't overtake the fruity aromas, you know? You've got that kind of funnel aromas, something that we really love, some of the bashes aromas, you know? The, the bashes aromas, they come from the Bura, for example, in, in this case, and that kind of funnel, some white pepper, I would say as well, that time, some, it's quite balsamic at the same time. Yeah. I really feel some, some mimphys, you know, some, some balsamic aromas, like eucalypt, some kind of, uh, of freshness. And we really want to preserve that kind of aromas in our wines. And what I really love is the way it changes. You know, once you, you make it breathe, it, it, it really turns in another, another type of fruit. Now it became uh, more stony, uh, kind of some apricot, some peach, and it really turns in other aromas. And I would say intensity. It's quite medium height to height, and it really gets high expression when you leave it for a few minutes. I don't really like to to serve it, to pour it too, too cold. We, we wrote down on the label between six and eight degrees, I prefer eight degrees, but that depends on everyone, you know? Some people like the, the white wine, very, very cold, very chilled. So what I usually say about this wine is, uh, it's quite dangerous because you drink the bottle and you don't notice, you know? <laughs> you really feel it, you want some more, yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. It's really lovely and round and um, still very bright. We've got, um, uh, a rule in the winery at 1.30 before uh, we go for lunch, we always have water bonnet maturation or a glass of white wine. Luis Cañas, he really was the, the one who made the, the glass of wine before we go for lunch. And he usually have it with uh, the olive soil. It's like the most popular aperitif Luis Cañas used to have. And he really made that, that every taste, you know? We, we still go, keep on doing that. Yeah. Unfortunately, he, he died last year okay. um, in December. He was uh, 92 years old, but well, uh, we do remember him so, so much. Well, uh, it's been such a pleasure to be, to be with you all. Um, uh, thank you very much for, for inviting us. Uh, it's been such a pleasure. Thank you. No problem at all. Thanks so much. Welcome back. Um, I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, I, we had someone in the chat apparently saying that they, they didn't know white, Rocky, white Rioja exists. There's a Rosado, a Rosé Rioja as well. It's a tiny percentage. I think you said 2% in the video. Absolutely. But, so, yeah, very, yeah. very very small. You know, the, the white wines of Rioja are 7 or 8% and mm -hmm. just a couple of percent Rosé. So, you know, it's, it's not an expectation. That every, it's not a thing that's all over the place. So no. it's interesting to see. It. And a lot of them are made in this very bright, fresh style as well. It's not often we're looking at these oak-aged... Um, couple of cool questions in there. Someone asked yeah. if there was any malolactic fermentation, which is when you take the, the malic acid, which is kind of like your apples and your sharp acid, and you transfer that into kind of like that creamy kind of mm -hmm. flavour. There isn't in this wine. Um, no, what, what it turns out is that because it's such a hot, hot country, um, malolactic fermentation is one of the things you can do in a cooler climate like your Burgundies or like England in particular when you're, you're talking about an English white wine. Um, it just helps reduce the acidity so it doesn't strip the, the, the enamel off your, your, your teeth. And um, um, so, But you're, you're getting some of the same richness which is coming just from the flavours of the barrels. You quite often get MLF associated with oak and it's actually it's quite hard to stop MLF happening in oak barrels because all of the, 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 the basically the organisms that do this this conversion it's not actually fermentation but they they're still it doesn't matter but yeah it takes malic it turns it to lactic and it's a bacteria that does that and uh, it's kind of hard to stop that when you've got something like oak involved that does it but you do you do have this richness in in white wines so they can come from multiple mm -hmm. different things and as we go through um you know these these masterclass in this adventure series we'll, we'll kind of do these little segments like alex is yeah. doing on oak today but you've got malolactic fermentation which will give a white wine its richness you've got lees aging which is where they keep the bits in there and stir it up and then you've got oak which are your three main things that are going to give that wine extra richness there was a, a question about food pairing obviously that cl classic kind of like you know seafood tapas would go very very well with this got asked oh, about dang. british cheese um because obviously it's hey we're not in the eu anymore as we were Greatly reminded. Um, so for that, I think something like a cheddar would be good. An aged cheddar that's got that little bit of salinity, that mm. little bit of crumbliness will stand up quite nicely to it. Um, 
But there's also um, a lot of um, dairies out there, especially in England, and I don't have a prime example for you, but there's a lot of them making these styles of cheese. So they make a brie style cheese or a manchego style cheese yeah. with British milk. We make so many great cheeses here that you can say, you know, you find a good local cheese shop, especially someone that specialises in British, and go, you know, my pairing for this would be manchego as, yeah. my, as my Spanish cheese. But if you go say, have you got something that's like manchego made in the UK? I'm sure there is a dairy out there that is doing something like that. I think that would be a cracking pairing, yeah. No, really good. Um, yeah, so, I mean, Wine 1, I, I hope people liked it. I think the comments seem to have been... There's some really, really great tasting comments. Um, but when it comes to the, the more technical things of this tasting, just before we get on to the next two, um, what, what would you say... I mean, is that, obviously, they're, they're trying to not do the MLF to preserve a bit of acidity. Mm -hmm. Does this come as a sort of a, a 3 or a 4 on the scale, do you think, or...? Or a little bit lower. Which part of my scale? So on the acidity scale. On the acidity yeah. scale. I think it's relatively high. What mm -hmm. you've got to bear in mind when you're talking about these tastes, it's, it's everything in balance. Yeah. So to be able to have this level of richness, you need to have very good acidity. Yeah. Otherwise, it will just taste kind of flat and flabby and a bit boring. So even if the acidity isn't there absolutely in your face, you can still have high mm -hmm. acidity in a wine. It's about balance. So I would say this was... Probably a four out of five in the acidity, if that's what we're... That's good. If we're that on agrees our, with me. If we're on our uh, online wine tasting club five-point scale that yeah, we've decided yeah. is the new standard <laughs> of wine tasting. We have. Um, we also have... The, there's the, there are two other systems, standard international systems, for deciding what wine tastes like and, uh, you know, basically evaluating them. And um, one's by the uh, Wine and Spirits Education Trust. We've got that on the... Uh, which, uh, Caroline, can we pop the WSET thing? Um, and it, it talks about low, medium, or high as you go up the, the, into the higher uh, levels. It becomes a little bit more more um, precise than that. But ultimately, what you're trying to do when you get to the end of all of this is go, right, what does that mean? Do, and how do I then evaluate? So yeah. Is the wine balanced? Has it got good length? Has it got intensity? Has mm -hmm. it got complexity? Yeah. And then you put those things together to go, is this a good quality wine? Yeah. And that's how you do it. And if you do whichever system you use, mm -hmm. whether you use the WSET, the Quarter Master Sommeliers, or the, uh, the absolutely brand new online wine tasting club <laughs> tasting system, which we uh, would recommend you... No, no. Yeah. WSET is a good way to go. But if you do these things, you'll be able to put each wine in its place because mm -hmm. there's going to be a wine that's cheap and chi cheap as chips that's really quite good. And it might have good acidity, yeah. good length, good finish for what it is. And you can't compare it to something that's, you know, 300 quid a bottle, no, generally. Um, but and that's why we've added this little bit at the bottom of the first page, which is the value, you know. So it, it, you can say this is an absolutely stunning wine, but my God, it's 100 quid a bottle. I'm not going to buy that. So it's not good enough value. So... Um, you can buy it for me. Well, well, absolutely, you can buy it for us. That that's that's not a problem. Um, I love his story about the fact that before lunch they they stop and they have a glass of wine in the winery. I don't know any other wineries who have traditions at all similar to that. Do you? I'm getting some eyebrows from across the room at me. Um, perhaps before we, um, I'm, I'm sure we've got lots of really great questions, but I'm eager to keep things moving on. What we thought we might just do is tell you a little bit about one of the crazier traditions of the Rioja region, which is, well, do you know what? I'm not even going to tell you. Uh, should we just run the video? Uh... Yeah, video. The Battaglia de Vino takes place about four miles outside of Haro, in the heart of La Rioja. The event is held every year on June the 29th and dates back to the 6th century. During this event, locals and visitors gather for the world's biggest wine fight. In the morning, everyone attends mass before following the mayor on horseback out of the town to climb the Riscos del Bilibio, an area full of strange rock formations, and it's here that the battle begins, essentially an elaborate evolution of a wine baptism. The aim of the fight, if there is one, is to cover each other in so much wine that everyone's clothes turn purple and no one is left wearing white at all. At noon, the fight stops and everyone feasts on lamb chops and snails. The party continues back in Haro with live music, dancing and street stalls. I'd go along for the experience, but I doubt they use their finest wine. I hope you like that. It's just a little bit of fun. I mean, it looks incredible, uh, a, a ridiculous thing. Apparently, they all they all sit up the night before drinking as well, before they turn up drunk to mass the next morning. But yes. uh, so, when are we going? When are we going? Well, good question. It's a, a question that seems to bother us all. But let's move on to the first of our battles of the red, and this is a battle of place. 
and um, it's not been a traditional thing. You heard the, the, the guy from Lucania, uh, Oscar, talking a bit about this, and they're all trying to move a bit more in this direction um, uh, and go away from the sort of the, the hiding the character of the soil and the character of the place that, that made that wine. But these guys are taking this to perhaps the next level. So what I would say about these, this one is we're going to have compare wines two and three. But actually, it turns out he recommended that we drink wine three before we try wine two. But obviously well, try them both not, at the same not, time. Not so much before, you know. It's, it's the joy of I thought I knew what I was doing for a moment. <laughs> um, but I, I got to talk to Andres and then we did the tasting and he said, let's start with the... Um, that Vada Buena, which is wine number three in there, and then the Letha, which is wine number two. So when we get to the tasting portion of this interview, when we talk about the first wine, it's going to be kind He's of wine number wine three, three instead of wine number two, just so I hope there's not any confusion. I'm in the chat to, to help you along with that. Um, and just, yeah, quickly before we go to the, the video, A, somebody's asked a... Um, a uh, quick question about how representative this is of the uh, the old vines white Rioja. Um, to be honest, there's not huge amounts of it made. So when people are doing these uh, these old vine Riochas with the 40 year old vines, it's kind of it becomes stylistic to what the winemaker is. But they are just generally a bit richer and rounder and bigger than you're going to get from your yeah. your standard uh, Riochas. And a lot of it comes down to how much of the um, the other grapes they put in it, they're putting the, any Verdejo and bits and pieces in there to kind of give that acidity. So a lot more of it will be about the blend rather than the style. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, the, the next interview, um, we got to talk to Andres, who's, a, who's an MW, of which there's about 400 in the world right yeah. now. So uh, really guy. exciting. So he, uh, he does all the fun stuff with them. So we'll, uh, we'll do wine two and three. When we get to the tasting, we'll taste it three and two. I hope that's not too confusing for anyone. If we'd done that Sorry. as the fourth and fifth <laughs> wine, could have been dangerous. Yes, it could. Um, but let's, uh, let's pop on to the, the next interview. Once again, great stuff in the chat. So uh, keep that rolling. Keep we'll coming. keep getting back to you. Hello, Jamie. Afternoon, how are you? How are you? Yeah, very good, thank you. Very good. No, thank you very much for uh, taking a little bit of time to talk with me today. You are our first MW on any of these tastings, so oh, that's, really? kind, that's okay. really exciting. I have plenty of us these days. It's also an excuse to drink good wine and to travel. Well, I'm, I have a German name and a German accent, but I really am a Spanish wine producer and have been the wine business in Spain for over 25 years now. So I've run wineries big and small, made wine all about around the country, sold it around the world. And about uh, six years ago, a group of friends really decided to, to come together to create the wine company of our dreams. Uh, we said, let's, let's try to make a wine company that can be driven on values and where we can have real fun. So think very hard why a wine exists. And for us as wine geeks, it always has a cultural component. Of course, we love wine. We love to drink it for the taste, but we also drink it because of the social component, of the gastronomic component, and I dare to say the aesthetic uh, intellectual component. It's, it's a cultural vehicle that helps us actually to connect with a place, with a landscape, with people, with a history. And now, three years ago, we, dis we finally found our dream project in Rioja to try to add something to what is arguably the most famous and well-known uh, wine production area in Spain. And so that there was no no way we would just go into Rioja to make another Rioja like wonderful wines that are around and, and made by people who have been doing this for generations. So we, we thought very hard, what can we add? In a nutshell, it's trying to make wines that are a bit more focused on site, on place, and less focused on process. The best examples of, of classic Rioja are among the greatest wines in the world. And, and I drink them all the time and I, I just love them. And they're completely, um, have a very strong personality that comes from that, from that aging process mainly. So, cause, cause if I'm right in saying Rioja, the set, the setup generally in Rioja is a bit like Bordeaux that you've got the Chateau in the middle and then the vineyards around the edge. And that's kind of that, that wine remakes wine from there. And it looks like what, what, you're doing is a little bit almost like Burgundian in style that, you know, you, you make it here, but you've got a plot here and a plot here and a plot here that is going to be vastly different. So you can then go, oh, great, we're going to have the wine from there was phenomenal this year because it was high altitude. And it was a warmer year. The wine from here was better when it was low altitude, a little bit cooler. And then you can kind of pick and choose and you'll have that vintage variation and each wine will go, will we'll tell its own story. We have to prove that it's interesting to people. Those, those, those differences in sub 
regions, in villages, and in passes show if they really have an expression in the glass and how enjoyable and how interesting is that. I mean, we're in Rioja La Vesa, uh, which is a, a political demarcation, uh, but we actually, from a winemaking perceptive, uh, perspective, we uh, group Alavesa and San Sierra which is a part of Rioja Alta, which are north of the Ebro River. And you know, in, in the wine business, we are all a bit obsessed about the minerals in the soil, but there is really a link between uh, the setup of your soil and the personality of the wines. And limestone is linked to certain attributes uh, that we like, uh, especially a very fine, uh, compact tannin uh, texture and structure that makes very age-worthy wines. And I dare to use the word minerality, you know, it's a big uh, term, everybody discusses it. But I really do believe that there is a link between a saline tension uh, on the palate of wines and limestone. Uh, it's, it's, there are some studies on that, it's very hard to to document and to understand from a scientific point of view, of view, but from an empiric point of view, and in my uh, 25 years experience of winemaking, there clearly is a link. Uh, most of those vineyards were planted and not touched again. So there's no other place in Rioja where you have that wealth of really old uh, vineyards in small, small parcels. So you have altitude, limestone, and really old vines. And old vines are not good per se just because of the age they're also good or interesting because in those years when they were planted there were no commercial clones of Tempranillo available people would use cuttings that were available in the area so there is a remarkable genetic uh, variation in the Tempranillos that we have in those little villages of Rio Jalavesa. And we believe that part of the personality of the different villages, and we will go through that later when we taste the wines, has actually to do with the genetic setup of those vineyards. Uh, so what we want to do is to contribute with a very strong team of people, very con like, like, like passionate people about that, these kind of wines with like a perfect little setup of vineyards and, 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 and a new one that is specifically designed to try to get those differences in personality into the glass. And you will have to judge if we, if we are able to do it or not. They're just starting. Uh, what we are tasting today is our very first vintage 18. So we have a long journey before of us, but I truly believe that if we manage to do terroir-driven wines of sight in Rioja La Vesa, we will actually make Rioja a more interesting place in, as, as a whole. But if there is one ground zero for great Tempranillo, it's without any doubt the highest parts of Rioja. The interesting thing is all those, many of the top, top uh, producers in Rioja have always sourced grapes from the best parts of the region. But because of that, I would say in the best sense of the word, industrial tradition. So the focus was, was much more on defending my winery name and the Rioja brand than in actually putting the regional or local differences forward. Because it was perceived that the best wine was made by actually blending those different elements. And it's a valid approach. You can claim that uh, every wine is a blend and often you make the best, a better wine by blending, not just uh, across regions, also across varieties. And it makes a lot of sense. Or you can blend a bit of, say, say riper, warmer Tempranillo from Rioja Baja or with a bit of Garnacha from Rioja Baja. And you can make a beautiful, a uh, very harmonious wine. But I think there's also a place for the opposite approach of trying to go to a smaller place and expressing that smaller place and see if it's interesting in the glass. But it has to be real and it has really to be tasteable. What's very important is that we avoid like empty marketing of saying, hey, this is a vintage wine. If you can't taste the vintage in the glass, there's no worth to that claim. It might perfectly be that you say, hey, I just want a nice wine from Badiola, and because it's from Alavesa, and because it's from that winery, I know it will be very fresh, it will be very gastronomic, it will be very drinkable, it will have a lot of purity, because that's what we do. And it can be a very, very good thing for a region that's up and coming, that, you know, you look at, I think Mendoza recently has done very, very well, and there's some phenomenal wines there, and also some very poor wines. Do you see that same problem with Rioja, that there's people out there that go, oh, I, I don't like Rioja, but the only Rioja they've had is something that's of a, a poor quality, and they just think Rioja is Rioja is Rioja. It's a huge problem. It's 
everything you do is like a double-edged sword. The success of Rioja has been in how easy it is to recognize and how consistent it is and how good a quality it offers even at very competitive prices. It's really hard to get an undrinkable Rioja. But the problem is the combination of Rioja being defined mainly by its aging process has also like flattened uh, the perception of people in terms of, of, of diversity. And it's actually a pity because, uh, you know, the, the, the quality, the traditional quality um, echelons of Joven, Crianza and Reserva, well, it's only defined by how long you keep the wine in a barrel. And arguably, technically speaking, from a winemaking perspective, there's no reason a wine is better just because you keep it for a longer time in barrel. Uh, so the, the, the rules of Rioja, having achieved a certain, um, say, consistency and typicity, which really comes from the winemaking process, has also limited the ability to express all those diverse um, uh, ways of, of approaching wine. So in our case, we will actually not follow the rules of Crianza and Reserva. We will have a whole bunch of aging uh, vessels, sizes, materials, concrete, oak, old oak, new oak, big oak, small oak, stainless steel even, and then give each wine each parcel and each vintage exactly what we think it needs to express that origin best. The great thing about wine is uh, the balance between primary fruit aromas uh, and they should uh, and 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 say complex uh, tertiary aromas. We don't like secondary aromas, which are the ones which come from the winemaking process. Yeah, so we are. It's actually it's it's it's, it's really exciting. We haven't done many uh, public tastings of these wines yet, but they're just being launched. So we are looking at two of the village wines. I suggest that we taste Villa Buena first, and the second one will be Letha. These are from our very first vintage. The reason we bought that particular winery with my partner Gorka was because it was linked, it is linked to 80 hectares of amazing, wonderful vineyards. There are th over 300 parcels of vineyards. Uh, as I said before, really small, tiny parcels, average 0.3 hectare, hectares, and they are distributed around our, our, our winery is in the, in the village of Villabuena, where Luis Cañas also is, I think you have another one, and all the villages around. So we have vineyards in Villabuena, in Leza, in Samaniego, La Guardia, Baños de Ebro, El Ciego. When you drive through them, you, you start to see a pattern between those different villages, there, there, there are differences in those villages. But there's a trend uh, of a similarity between the altitude, the aspect, and probably even the genetic uh, makeup of those of those vineyards. So we set out to go and select the, our favorite parcels in those different villages and to vinify them separately to see if there was a difference, vinifying them exactly in the same way. And we had no clue if it would work or not. And I was so happy when, I, when, when the wines were starting to get dry. You know, you taste, when they are fermenting, you, you can't really see through them. And then suddenly, towards the end of fermentation, and when they are dry, you start tasting. And then you say, oh, okay, I'm seeing a difference here. And that was, well, <laughs> we were quite lucky that, we, that, that the difference is there. We aged them the same way, bottled them nine months ago now, and are launching them as we speak, or, or a couple of months ago. So we believe they're starting to show those, those differences in the glass. And, and we can discuss those differences, but what I would really like you guys to do is to taste them and decide for yourself how much difference you can, you can see. What is, what is clear is that there has been, uh, in the old days, there was a tradition of making village wines. And if you talk to the old growers in, the, in those local little villages, they will all tell you, oh, the wines from that village is so, and this is there. And they will always tell you, I like this one more. I go to the vineyard, uh, you know, they're like, like the Fiesta de la Vendimia. After harvest, they're harvest celebrations. And they tend to be in each village. And people go to the village where they like the wine most. And they will tell you things, oh, I never go to that village because I don't like the wines. So th they had that idea. And the old cellar masters that started blending traditional Rioja in the early 20th century also knew that. They would actually take different villages to make their perfect little cocktail uh, for the wines. But over the years, we have lost that, that information. There's very little written about it. So we are just starting to identify those differences and to try to put words and, uh, and describe it and and, and, and bring up some adjectives that we think 
fit those different villages. The first one is Villa Buena. Villa Buena is, is, is a beautiful village where our winery is and where we have most vineyards. For me, it's a perfect middleweight Rioja La Vesa. So maybe what we can do in tasting, we can maybe focus on structure first, mm -hmm. uh, try to see if there's difference in, in weight, uh, in, in alcohol, and try to look at the tannin, not just the quality of tannin, but the texture of the tannin. And you know, uh, winemakers sometimes forget the uh, tactile element in tasting a lot. And I think it's quite interesting to, to, to compare. Uh, so Via Buena is like, in the terms of our altitudes, like in the middle of the altitudes, like a little bit of everything. Letha is much more towards the mountains. So those vineyards are, are much later ripening. There might be three weeks difference in the same region between the first village and the last. So that you can really see that in the fruit profile. Um, you can see it in terms of alcohol. You can see it in, in terms of, of structure. So... Letha, the second wine, uh, has easily half a degree more alcohol than, than Villa Buena. If you, if you smell it, even, even, even without moving the glass, there's a different fruit profile. Uh, Villa Buena has, for me, those typical Tempranillo berry fruits uh, on, the, on the red side of the, of the, of the berry, maybe some, some Mediterranean herbs in the mix there. Letha, by comparison, is a darker fruit. There's, there's very little red fruit. It goes more into blues and blacks, and there's an inkiness to it. And it goes through to the palate. Uh, Via Buena is a bit more approachable. Both of them have nice freshness, but uh, you have good, fine tannins. But in comparison, Letha has much more compact, firm tannins. It's more muscular. They are both 100% Tempranillo. They have been made in the same way. Uh, we age about half of the wine in, in a combination of small and big oak, and then we blend it back with a part that has been in, in neutral vessel. Uh, and we are still learning about the, about the, right, the right percentage. They need air, so uh, I, I don't know how they travel. I think with, uh, when you have them in the bags, it's probably a good idea to uh, swill them a bit and, and see how they evolve in the glass, because they're only at the very beginning of their drinking window. I <laughs> They're, they're both wonderful wines. They're both really, really good. Um, I like the fact that the, the first wine, it feels a touch fresh a little bit. You get more of that kind of like acidity coming through, a little bit more zippiness to it. It's kind of like bright, fresh fruit. And then when you go into the leather, it's it's a little bit rich, a little bit more, you know, there's a little bit more oomph about it, a little bit more powerful. A little thing for when people see the label. So they're, they're both they're both kind of labelled with a, a set of letters and numbers. Is yep. that a is that a branding thing? It's a legality problem. Traditionally, Rioja had been very restrictive in what you can put on the label. Anything that's not say literally allowed is outlawed by definition. In the last years, there has been a big pressure on the on the region by more terroir driven producers to be able to make a parallel pyramid if you want of quality that you can actually tell people where the grapes come from so why should you not be allowed to do that so they came up with a new classification after much much discussion called vinos de municipio which are village wines so the essence or the motivation is the right one but because of differences of opinion in, in, the, in the governing council, there were limitations put into that law. You can only use the village name if you have your winery in that village, the bloody building, which actually goes against the whole sense of terroir. So we are in Villabuena, so we could put Villabuena and Megabino de Municipio from the village of Villabuena, but we have wonderful, wonderful vineyards that are literally two kilometers away in Letha, and we cannot use the word Letha unless we had a winery there, which is completely, uh, makes no sense at all because even the smallest traditional growers typically have vineyard parcels on the borders and in two or three villages or even more. So the way around was actually to register brands that represent those villages. So instead of Letha, we have registered the brand L3Z4. At the first we thought, well, it will be a problem. People won't understand. We have found that people are loving it. And the best news is that in those three years that we have been vinifying, we can already see that village character shining through year after year. With the two I've got in front of me here, it absolutely shows that there's a, you know, 
a great difference. You know, there's definitely each wine has its very, very own style that, you know, you put them side by side and then you taste them again, you know, you'd know which one was which, which I think yeah. is absolutely fantastic. Thank you ever so much for your time and, and sharing these wines with us. Thank you. Right. Well. Thanks very much. Bye. Bye. Okay. Is that it? Is that it? We're back. <laughs> do you I've know not what? drunk he, my wine too much. Having to cut him down was one of the hardest things I've had to do because it, it was all so really interesting. I think one of the things that really came over to me was a, there was a great question in the chat, which was, um, are, uh, is this one aged a bit more in oak? And the answer is actually no. He did mention it briefly. He said he vinified them, which is the way of saying he turned it into wine in as close a way as possible. And um, that's one of been, been one of my bugbears because you'll go to a place and they'll, it'll be like, let's say you go to Burgundy and they'll say this side of the road is worth four times the price of the wine from this side of the road. But what they don't tell you is they also used much more expensive barrels. They did much more expensive winemaking techniques. They just took a lot more care on the one which is more expensive so um what he's he seems to have gone it's a he's a real wine nerd and um uh i, I think he's done some really cool wine making techniques and has tried to he tried to make it as precise and fair as possible to find out if there actually is a difference between these two sites and we've got a couple of weeks of uh, a difference between the harvest date they're all started flowering the same days and um yeah it's uh, I, 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 I think my, my, if I just had to pick one now, wine to the Letha is by far and away my favourite. I, I, someone picked up that toffee that I'm, I'm getting. Um, it's definitely smoother. It, uh, the other one is a bit more austere. It, it's, it's, it's a little bit more, more crunchy. When we talk yeah. about the tannins, uh, because that, that's, that's a good question, because tannins is a word that gets banned about, and you can have grippy tannins you can have smooth tannins you can have chewy tannins there's lots of words to describe yeah. the tannins but the, the in the, actually is... in the oak video a bit later you might spot a couple of the reasons because actually what we talk about is that there are individual blocks which are a tannin and then they combine to form uh, longer chains and the each of the individual blocks can be one thing and that defines the texture as, as much as anything Okay, then, so I'm, I'm not allowed to talk about tannins anymore. Oh, I'll he's, shut he's, up. He's, he's made a pretty video, so <laughs> yeah. don't yeah, worry we'll about talk, it. We'll, we'll look at the video later. But um, if, he do, if, he, if his video doesn't answer the yeah. questions, come back and go, Alex, your video didn't yeah. answer my questions. But, but before, we, before we do that, speaking I mean... Speaking of questions. Speaking of questions, yeah. yeah see what I did there? That's very Get good. Back I like in. it. So, um, for those of you who have joined us before, I like to ask a, a question. And it's, it's, not, it's not about winning or losing or prizes or skills or whatever. It's just a little bit of fun. Yep. Um, but if I asked you how many crews there are in Beaujolais, or if I asked you how many vineyards are there in Rioja, we've all got laptops. We all play Google. We're all very good at that. However, so what we have to ask today, and we'll get to Alex's oak video, and there was one of the biggest oak barrels ever made. Mm -hmm. And it was called a Hercules. And it was big. It's big. Bigger than this. Yep. Tell you that for nothing. Um, but the question is, if we took all of the wine that was made in the 2019 vintage in Rioja and we put this wine into these Hercules barrels, how many Hercules barrels would we need? So we should have a little poll pop up so you can answer your question. So um, let's go for it. Let's get that going. Brilliant. And, um, and while Caroline's popping that, that poll up, uh, which you can do, uh, we, we can go off and have a little, uh, little look at a video about oak, from which I get a little bit carried away. But, uh, but it's quite an interesting topic, and it's, uh, you know, while all these people are going, we're trendy, we're going to back away from the use of oak, I mean, come on, we like wines that have got the right amount of oak. So, let's have a look at the video. Those green-robed senators of mighty woods Tall oaks, branch charmed by the earnest stars, dream and so dream all night without a stir. That is what Keats had to say about oak trees. I don't think I can beat his words, but there really is something quite special about them. Now, we often hear winemakers talking about oak, but what do we actually mean? Firstly, most people assume we're talking about barrels of different sizes. Barrels are very expensive, up to 3,000 euros for a standard sized one, in fact. And that only stores 300 bottles of wine. So that can add up to 10 pounds to the cost of the wine. Let's start off looking at how barrels are made because you might be surprised at how intricate it is. 
Firstly, an old oak tree that is the perfect shape and size is found to cut down. These are normally around 100 years old. They're cut or split into planks, and these are left in giant piles to be seasoned for about a year or so. During this time, microorganisms start doing some work on them and changing the characteristics of the wood, and it all just mellows. When it comes time to be used, the planks are planed and smoothed to make the final shapes for the barrel. These are then arranged into a flower shape with a hoop at the bottom. After this, they are toasted. That is, a fire is lit in the middle of it, and the wood is left to generate a little bit of a crust, and we'll come to why later. The barrel is squeezed into the right shape, and more hoops are pushed down, before adding tops and bottoms, and being tested and made water and wine tight. It turns out that wine is less dense than water, so it leaks even more. Now, we use oak and wine for two different reasons. First, it's the flavour that they add flavours like vanillin, but secondly, they let a tiny amount of air into the wine which helps it mature. Too much is very bad, but too little makes for a harsher wine. We'll talk about the flavours first. You'll perhaps not be shocked to learn that not all breeds of oak tree are the same. Some are even poisonous. It's like the difference between an Earl Grey and a Lapsang Souchon tea. Some is in the type of plant, and some is in how it's treated. The two main types are what's called French oak, or American oak. French oak's generally regarded as high quality. That's a bit unfair, it's just associated with a certain flavour profile. American oak is generally a little sweeter, but there's also Hungarian oak which is rising in popularity. We often talk about food pairing, but there's definitely pairings which work better with wood as well. French oak goes best with Pinot Noir, Chardonnay, Cabernet Sauvignon, while American oak is better with Zinfandel and Tempranillo, such as in Rioja. But it's not just the type of oak, that toasting has a huge effect. If you don't toast it, the wine tastes, well, of oak. But beyond this, it generally makes the wine taste sweeter, then adds flavours of vanilla, crusty toast, nuts and smoke before finally ending up acrid and burnt. Many winemakers like to use a blend of wines aged in different kinds of oak treated differently. The sheer number of different compounds this adds gives real complexity to the wine. But young barrels also act like sponges. They absorb the wine several bottles worth. It's much worse for a cut oak, like American, than it is for wood that's split along the grain, like French oak. The older the barrels, the more subdued the flavouring effect gets. Really old barrels are known as neutral, which means they add a negligible amount of flavour. Most barrels are around 225 litres. The bigger the barrel, the less flavour it adds, because while there might be more wine, there's less oak touching the wine. The biggest oak fermenter we've ever come across is this one, Hercules. This took 20 Master Coopers three whole months to make. I can't even imagine how much that one costs. Of course, wineries are businesses. And using oak adds an awful lot of cost and complexity, so the accountants wanted to try to find a cheaper way. The first thing that winemakers did to add oak flavours was to dip staves or spirals, big chunks of oak on strings, into the wine as it sat in the steel tanks, a bit like dunking a tea bag. Large scale winemakers want to get the wine out as soon as possible, so rather than use one big lump of wood, breaking it into smaller chips makes that process much faster. But it is coarser too you start getting the bad characteristics from the wood as well. But it's the only cost-effective way to add an oaky character to a budget bottle of wine. But this is what led to the over reputation of some Australian and American Chardonnays that just ruined this poor innocent grape. Anyway, the other side, aging. Without going too sciencey, the young harsh tannins in wine, which largely come from the skins, need to link up together with other tannins. And some of these come from the wood too, but to do that, they need oxygen. Luckily, wood is a little porous, and so lets in that tiny amount of air necessary to join those compounds together or polymerise them, which is to form longer, smoother chains, mixtures of wine and oak tannins, which are much, much more pleasant. Too much oxygen, however, and all of your fruit flavours will get destroyed. Of course, accountants are still looking for shortcuts, and people have found ways to try to get this micro-oxygen effect by putting small pipes into the stainless steel tanks that allow a little bit of oxygen to seep in and bubble through. Other people are trying to reduce the price of oak by using some really creative solutions. These ones from Ribarique are very cool. They have oak staves in a cuboid tank which is far more space efficient and they're flat, so it's much easier to take them apart, plane them down and re-toast them, making it much more reusable. Finally, there's the question of when you use the oak and for how long. The longer you leave the wine in contact with the oak, the more of an effect it has. From our discussions with winemakers, there's some vastly different ideas about which stage is best to use it. Fermenting an oak certainly gives a very different flavour to ageing an oak, 
but this is a yet another part of winemaking which comes down to a mystical combination of art and science, and you can't look at it just on its own. Each winemaker is crafting their own technique and has their own views about oak, which imparts a really unique style on the wine, and it either works as a whole piece or not. It's not just what they do with that one thing. Oak can be brilliant. It can be so subtle it just changes the texture of the wine, or it can slap you in the face. Winemakers are increasingly shying away from the in-your-face style and are seeking out subtleties in how these simple, natural materials can be brought together to form something which is utterly magical. Welcome back. Um, yeah, it's a really interesting topic. You can't possibly do it justice in uh, in five, six minutes. But um, I so hope we gave you... Best, we, though, yeah, you? I tried my best. Well I but I, I hope that it just gave you a little bit of an introduction. And I mean, I, we glossed over some of that hideous... Um, chemistry stuff but um there are th th the fact is there's not tannin is a group of different things it, they are um it's a group called polyphenols and um they they all start off quite short chains and then they build up to long chains and actually the bit i didn't mention is that then as you age the wine over time they then break back they get down again. Again. They, and and they also they drop down out of the wine that's what forms some of those sediments you get and in that process uh, colour is a poly. Uh, the colour in wines are polyphenol as well, and that also can drop out. That's why you you lose colour in wines; it, it gets older. But um, but I mean, there's unfortunately there's no really easy answers to why it's grippy or not. You can improve it by aerating. Um, if you give your wine a good, I mean, if you're, it's just like if you've got a, a, a really strong Italian uh, red wine. You, you you if you decant it, that will help it a lot. You make sure you swill it around the glass a bit. But actually. If you have it with food that's designed to absorb those tannins, something a little bit fattier, that will that will be really good to help you work with it. But the the reason, other than the flavours and, you know, the the texture that it gives you, um, one of the big reasons for keeping a lot of tannin is it's a preservative and it's a natural preservative. So you don't have to put in any artificial preservatives. It just absorbs the oxygen and, um, uh, yeah. And I think a lot of it comes down to what what else in the water. Oak is just such a yeah. little part of what happens with, with. Um, with your wine, if you've got a really big fruity wine, you can have loads of oak and yeah. almost not notice it. If you have a light, you can have a light wine and not very much oak, but that oak becomes overpowering. So once again, I'm, I'm going to say say the B word again, aren't I? It's all you about are, where where yeah. that balance is. So the same oak treatment on different wines isn't going to give you that same level of grippiness, that same level of tannin. Um, you know, if there's sugar, if there's fruit, is there this? There's all these different things that will um, mm -hmm. impact on the final style of the wine, and that comes down to winemaking decisions, monetary decisions. Unfortunately, a lot of the time, mm -hmm. um, you know, as it said, you know, if a top end, top end oak barrel can add ten quid to the cost of your bottle of yeah. wine. Yeah. So if you're buying a ten quid bottle of wine, you're going to get some air that was in an oak barrel. Maybe. Yeah. I mean, I mean I, it, that assumes you you throw it away afterwards. Obviously, you don't. You use it again in the following years, but. Um, we've got a nice question of how long you would age uh, that wine for, which was, was the, the wine number three, the, the Vibna in uh, hacker speak. Yeah. Um, it's I got the potential, it's, hasn't it's it? Got the, it's got the potential. And I, I think it, I really, really believe, like putting them side by side, I can see what a lot of these comments are. I really think this, you can drink it right now with food. Yeah. Absolutely. It, it's ready to go. It's not um, like a young Barolo. Not at all. Not right. at all. Um, but this could hang out for six, ten years, maybe. I think, I would think. So, yeah. um, and, and, and keep and keep developing. So yeah. a little bit of time. But I think what we'll see when we go to the the next set of wines, where there is more yeah. of a focus on the oak, that you'll really see where where oak comes. You know, the last two wines they do about forty five percent of the wine in a mixture of new oak and old oak, and then you know over half of it is in stainless steel. So there's not a lot of oak in the world of oak for the yeah. last two wines. Um, and then when we go into the next two wines, we're going for something, you know, what which we've already I, poured. Yeah, we've already we're poured, getting, so, uh, you know, we're getting ahead of the game. Yeah, um, but, 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 I, but look at the difference in colour, I'd say, before we even start on this, just look at the difference in colour. And there's only one year of difference between the two vintages, which is the year the grapes were picked. This, this one on my right, uh, sorry, this one is wine number four, that's a 2015, this is a 2014, but... It's a notable difference in colour. One's a lot more sort of ruby and one's sort of going into that sort of, you know, almost already slightly into the brown kind of side of things. I mean, it's not quite that extreme, but it's it's very, very noticeable to so see. We've, we've just had a really cool question come up here um, and I'll, I'll chuck my, my thoughts in and then you can add your thoughts. And it's why only oak? 
Um, and that's what we see. We see oak barrels and then it's stainless steel, concrete, stuff like that. There are some other people. There's there some are. people doing cherry. There's some people yeah. doing some weird bits and pieces out there. Um, but I think a lot of it comes with A, tradition, mm-hmm. and B, when you get into a lot of regions, the, uh, the Appalachian rules and regulations designate the wine has to spend a certain amount of time in an oak barrel. Yeah. So um, when you... Wait, when you compare it to whiskey, they use, they use all sorts of different kinds of wood, don't they? And, the, and, they, and they use wood that's been used for, for aging different kind of wines before. And they use sherry casks. But, but they, the Japanese use Mitsunaro wood, which is a really cool and totally different flavour profile. But some of the wine, it, some of it, it just... I think... Oak in particular is a very thick and uh, sorry, a very tight grained uh, wood, and it's very dense and it's very very hard. Um, when you go to some of the other woods, they 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 dominate the wine really really easily with their flavours, and oak's a bit more subtle than that. No, absolutely, absolutely, um, and yeah, it's. We'll see. There's always going to be someone doing something a little bit different. Yeah. Um, but before we before we get to the the, the next video, because we're we're going to do a reserva and a grand reserva. I thought I'd do a quick one, two, three on oh, yeah. Rioja plan. Rioja aging very quickly because yeah. we, we hear these words chucked around: reserva, grand reserva, um, crianza, roble, all those kind of things. And kind of what does that mean? Because we go to the new world, we go to America, and you drink their Chardonnay reserva. What does reserva mean? Nothing. Absolutely, Absolutely nothing. nothing. Um, if we go to um, Australia and it says old vines, what does that mean? Presumably pretty similar. Yeah, yeah. not much. <laughs> but when we're in Rioja, these words actually mean something. And yeah, you've got legally. Legally. Yeah. Um, so a crianza is going to spend at least a year in the That's barrel good. and then at least a year in the bottle afters. Um, if you go into the reserva, it's two years and then... Um, when we go into the Grand Reservas, it's two years in the barrel, three years in the bottle, or a, a combination. Oh, well, minim- minimum, isn't minimum, it? Yeah, minimum, minimum, yeah, minimum, minimum. Yeah. And a lot of people do longer. But what you will see, and I'm sure you probably can't see very well from all the way over here, um, but all these bottles have. I'm, should I come it, to it, the won't, it won't. It will won't. It won't. Okay. It's out of focus. Well, but yeah. it's out of focus. So we need to talk to the tech guys. Um, <laughs> but you'll see on the back of any bottle of Rioja that you have that will have this little seal on it. The co- shiny bit. That comes from the regulatory board. The wineries don't print these. No. You have to send your wine to the regulatory board and they check it and they make sure you've done what you need to do to get your Rioja. Mm-hmm. And that's that's all Riocas. Even if it's your, your cheapest chips, no oak, no nothing, you do that and you'll get your little green label. If you have done the oak aging and all the bits and pieces you need to do, you can jump up to your Crianza and you'll get a lovely little red label. If you go up to your next level and you do your reserva, you're gonna get your burgundy label. They must have been a bit stuck on colors to do yeah. red and burgundy. <laughs> red there was many other options, but that's where we go. It doesn't help the color blind, does it? And then when we go up to our grand reserva, I don't know why I'm picking these up for everyone to see, because no one can see that from over there, but you get a blue label. So you've got, so you've got to do these things to get that. So whether it says grand or grand reserva or whatever, if it doesn't have that, it's not. And you can only get these from the regulatory board. You can't print them. You can't buy yeah. them. And they've got little holograms and on as well. At, at, the, at, the, at the top end, you have to say how many bottles you made. If you look at this Marcus Marietta, um, the, the Grand Reserve that we're doing, I've got here bottle six hundred. Sorry, 776 of 28,914. So they would have 28,914 of these labels sent to them. Individually numbered. Individually numbered. Yeah. And then they will come in and they will check and they'll do a stock check and go, well, you said you've sold this many and that many and it needs to add up or there's big fines and you can get your uh, your regulatories uh, yeah. pulled from you. Um, but that's your, that's your weird tech bit for the day. Um, so we should probably have a little taste of these two wines. Um, someone said, how come she found a bit of cork in wine number five? Well, it's because they're all manually decorked, and we're, we're sorry about that. Um, uh, we don't like to filter the wine because the winemaker will have made the decision whether to filter it or not, but sorry about that. Uh, um, I hope you can fish that out. <laughs> Apologies for that. So, so shall we uh, so go to the video? Uh, or good. No? Yeah. But before we taste this, oh, yeah. shall I do the exciting bit about these guys? Or should we tell everyone let's, afterwards? Let's wait to the end. We'll yeah. tell everyone let's afterwards. Let's, let's drink some Marquis de Morieta. Yeah. So wine four and wine five. Well, my name is Borja, Borja La Roca. I'm the European Export Manager at Marquis de Morieta. And um, we're going to have a tasting of uh, two of our uh, 
wines, uh, two reds from, from, from Marques de Murrieta. But before we, we do the tasting, I'm going to give you a little introduction about who we are, where we come from, and how we do things, okay? Because I think it's very interesting to, to learn a little bit of the history of Marques de Murrieta before you taste the wines. Because once you, you learn a little bit of the history, then you will understand which, uh, what is inside each glass, okay? So Marques de Murrieta is a, is a winery that was founded by a gentleman called Luciano de Murrieta. And Luciano was an entrepreneur, and I will say as well, like a visionary, well ahead of his time. And um, he, he was, um, well, he was a Spanish born. He, he, well, he, was, he was born in Peru. His father was Spanish. His mother was from Bolivia. But when the, the independence revolution in Peru started, they moved back to Spain. Okay. And he came from a very wealthy family with a lot of business interests. And um, he, he, he got sent by his family to live in England, actually. And he lived in London for some time. And while living in London, he joined a wine club. And he was quite uh, amazed to find that uh, about the bad reputation that Spanish wines had at the time. Um, because the only wines that he could drink and find in England, and while drinking wine in this wine club, were uh, wines obviously from France, uh, ports and from Spain, the only wines that you could find there were cherries. And the reputation, as I said, of the steel wines from, from Spain was like really, really bad. So he thought like, why the French can do such a great wines? And we in Spain that have vineyards, nowadays it's, it doesn't even take three hours to, to drive from Rioja to Bordeaux. Um, with the same climate conditions, uh, vineyards, um, soils, everything. Why can't we do the same type of wines that they do in France? So he decided to move to the Medoc in order to learn wine making. And after, after spending some years there, he moved back to Spain and importing not only the knowledge, but mainly the tools that they were using in, in France and obviously the use of oak barrels. Um, so it was in 1852 when the first Marques de Murrieta wine was released into the market. With great success, he started to export his wines uh, to South America and Central America, Mexico and Cuba. Um, the first shipment of wines to Mexico never, got, never arrived because actually the, the, the boat sank, but the wines to Cuba arrived in, in good shape. And they were, they were actually sent in very tiny oak barrels of 70 liters a glass at the time was extremely expensive. And these wines were drank by mainly diplomats and politics of the time. It was in the 1870s when he actually got the, the Igai estate, which is our, um, our, our land, our, our, wine, where our winery is based. And it was in 1877 when the first very iconic wine from Marques de Murrieta was released, which is Castillo y Gai. What he wanted to do is to replicate uh, the chateau concept, okay? Uh, basically to have everything surrounding the winery in order to have absolute control of everything. Mm -hmm. So, as I said, years went by, the 20th century begins, and Luciano de Murrieta, at the age of the 87, he passed away, and the winery, was taken by the son of one of his nephews, um, uh, or one of his cousins, sorry, because Luciano um, never had any kids. So it was this other side of the family, the Olivares family, who took over the business. And the, the business uh, went really, really well for another two, three generations until 1983, when the actual family comes into play, which is the Febrian family. And it was in a very informal uh, dinner that Vicente Febrián, together with the Murrieta family, uh, were having a chat. And the Murrieta family said that they were thinking about selling the business. And Vicente Febrián saw a great business opportunity there. So he decided to buy the, the state. So he invested a lot of money in, in rebuilding and constructing and restoring the old buildings that were in the, in the, in the state. And also, what he did was to buy another 150 hectares of vines. So in total, Luciano had 150 hectares. Vicente Febrián bought another 150 hectares. So right now, Marques de Murrieta is the biggest single wine estate from La Rioja. 
um, with 300 hectares. And in the middle, we still have the castle. The 90s started and in 1996. At the age of 47, Vicente Cebrián passed away in his sleep of a heart attack, leaving behind, obviously, the four children and his wife. And this was, as you can imagine, a huge blow for the family um, because he was the head of the family and the, the, the charisma that Vicente had at the time was something that you cannot replace very easily. And the other thing is that it was his son Vicente Dalmao uh, was only 25. And he decided to take over the business. And there was actually a lot of speculation in the industry about what was going to happen with this winery, this very iconic winery, the first winery from La Rioja, in the hands of a kid that is just 25 years old. Now, um, uh, after many years and investing um, about 30 million euros, um, the winery is what it is now. Uh, we have achieved with, with, uh, within the years many, many awards, and we are the only winery from, from Spain that has a 100 points parking on a, on a dry white wine. We are the first winery from Spain that has been uh, appointed having a, a wine as the number one wine in the world by the Wine Spectator last year in 2020 with Castilla Guy 2010. So obviously the hard work and 25 years ahead of the winery by Vicente and Cristina are definitely uh, paying off now. But uh, Vicente was saying uh, two weeks ago when, or three weeks ago when we were told that we were having the number one from Wine Spectator, he was saying like, I haven't stopped working for 25 years, you know, and what we're gonna do now is to keep on working for at least another 25. What happened in the 90s is that there was an incredible, or end of the 80s, beginning of the 90s, there was an incredible breakthrough of new world wines in the world. And obviously, uh, uh, wine drinkers have started to change, uh, not only with the age, but as well in the taste. And we, we saw that at the time, that Rioja needed to adapt as well again, without losing its identity, you know? So if you were to drink wines from 30 years ago, from Rioja to now, there is a big difference in terms of how they, how is the approach of the wine, you know? Now what we have is more fresher, more approachable wines, wines that are, are appealing to every palate. Doesn't matter if you're an expert wine drinker or a novel wine drinker. If you go to a restaurant or to a wine shop, for example, and you say like, I don't know anything about wine. I'm going for, for dinner to a friend's house. What do I buy? Well, definitely, I will say that Marquesa Murgueta Reserva is the wine to recommend for what I said. It's something that everybody's going to like. You know, Even if you go to this friend's house and he knows a lot about wine, he's going to go, wow, I like this. You know, It's got the power. It's got the structure. It's got the flavors. It's got everything that I would look in a good wine. Okay? So this is Marquesa Murgueta Reserva. Okay. One million bottles, but of something that has that is always uh, splendid. But only the ten fir first months of the aging is in new oak. Ah, okay, yeah, that makes good so sense. You see, you don't have the punch of oak that you will get on a old style Rioja. You know, yeah, the, the oak here is more like thirty it's months and hope for the best. Exactly, here the oak is a lot more integrated. You know, with everything, with the flavors, with, with the acidity, which is, I think, very, very important. A lot of people ask about why, why you speak a lot about the acidity, because at the end of the day, the acidity is going to bring us freshness, you know, and the acidity is going to help as well the wine to age uh, well with time, you know. So that's, that's, that's why it's so, so important. Huh? Yeah. So in here, in this wine, um, what I said, you bring it to your nose, and I don't think that the first thing that you get is oak. I think that the first thing that you get is definitely a lot of fruit. Mm. But I will get like um, definitely wild uh, blackberries, a little bit of um, was orange peel, perhaps, a little as well of uh, balsamic. Mm. But it's got a lot of things. It's licorice, uh, 
know, it is. You know? every, every time you go back, there's something new. You go, yeah, there's you know, you go of lots of dark forest fruits. Oh, there's a bit of this, a bit of that. It's it's a, it's it's got nice complexity, but it's 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 not overbearing. It's not. Oh my word, there's so much going on in here. Um, it's yeah, very it's, precise. It's a very precise wine. No, it's, it's everything is really well into place, and um, it's, it's very polished. No, it's everything that ha that is in the wine is. It's very, very well integrated. Huh? Yeah. So when and then when you drink it, wow! Is the freshness, the freshness of the wine? You know, I love it. I love the tannins, which you know are fantastically well there. You know, there. I mean, it's like. What time is it? It's like uh, 20 to 11, you know? And you drink a wine at 20 to 11 in the morning and you go like, oh, mm, you know, but hey, wow, this tastes like really fresh, really appealing. You know, it's definitely, it's a wine that, you know, it's, invite you to, it's inviting you to have another sip, you know? And it's definitely a wine that you can have on its own, but of course you can have it with any type of food. And I think in Marquesa Murrieta is something that we, we like to, 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 to promote and is to people to be brave enough to combine these wines, especially Marquez de Murrieta wines, with some kind of fish as well. Because people, a lot of people will say like, oh, red is for meat, white is for fish. I always say to people like, why don't you have this, for example, with some turbot? Why don't you have this wine, for example, with some smoked salmon, you know, quite like meaty kind of fish, you know, sardines. I will definitely go with the dorada, for example, you know, this kind of like big uh, meaty fish, it definitely goes extremely, extremely well with these kind of ones. Okay, well, we're gonna go for the Gran Reserva. A few barrels of the Reserva are kept to age for a bit longer, and then they're bottled, and then they're aged for three years, okay? So this one was aged for 25 months in American oak, huh? And then really uh, put in the bottle for another three years, and uh, just just was released just like uh, just before Christmas, basically. You know, yeah, it's about September, October when we released this one. Okay, so when when you compare both wines, and we're gonna see it now in the nose and uh, in the mouth. You know, I like to compare them like the Reserva is like a teenager. And the Grand Reserva is already a grown up, mm. you know. Um, the Reserva is, is a very much a wine that, you know, is very lively. He wants to be out and about and so off, you know, and drink me, drink me, drink me, no? Grand Reserva still has the freshness, still has the, the, the it's still a young wine, because for me the 14 is still very young. No? But it's, it's a wine that is asking you to enjoy with time you know, and to take your time doing a meal uh, an hour or two while you drink this wine and you pair it with, with, uh, with good food, you know. So in here, what we have is a blend as well of obviously for, for uh, grapes. Huh? So we have mainly Tempranillo. We always use more than 80% Tempranillo eh? in the Reserva, Gran Reserva. Here we have a 84% Tempranillo, okay. We do a little bit of Mazuelo. Well, Graciano, 9%, 5% um, uh, Mazuelo, and a little bit of Garnacha, which is a very, very tiny a bit of just 2%, plus the 25 months in, in American oak. The same, only the first 10 months is in new oak, okay? okay? For the same reason, okay? We don't want to have the oak to be the main character of the wine, okay? We want to be the oak part of the wine, not the main character, okay? Well, only in the nose, when you, when you smell it, you know that you're gonna have something more serious, you know? You're gonna have something more, uh, hey, you know, this, is, this needs to have more attention in a way, okay? Obviously in the nose you still have, or you still find very much similar things to the Reserva, but they are more concentrated, you know, more, with a lot more structure, the, 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 
the black uh, fruits are a lot more um, with deeper aromas. You know, you have more more mature. Uh, yeah, black fruit. a little bit almost like stewed dried fruit rather than that bright very very fresh lively fruit it's the, yeah, exactly. the intensity the exactly. concentration is there it's 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 yeah it's wonderful and i think what you, sorry go ahead no no i was gonna say another things that you may have in this wine you know you can find a little bit of cassis uh i i, I get a little bit of uh, tobacco or perhaps a cigar box you know, this fresh cigar box that you get when you open these, these boxes, no? Um, even though tea, tea leaves, you know, as well. I don't know if you get that as well, huh? Yeah, it's definitely got a lot of that, that tertiary development, that kind of graphite kind of thing. It's yes. not going on. And what I think is great about this, um, and this may just be my opinion, um, but the fact the two wines are so different, is amazing because sometimes you find wineries um, who who make their wines at you know at maybe a slightly cheaper price point that their Crianza, their Reserva, and their Grand Reserva, they all seem much of a muchness. And you go, what? Why am I spending an extra whatever? Why am I spending this? There's not a huge difference between the styles of wine. These two are vastly different, and yeah. I think also what's important here is. It's not one that it, one is better than the other. One is definitely more expensive than the other because of the time and the aging, that kind of stuff. But one of these wines cries out to sit down, have fun, drink it, get it out with your mates and, and go. And then there's another one that goes, well, I need to sit down and I need to have dinner with it. So it's not one is, is better than the other. It's about every wine should have its, its own occasion. And what is the occasion to open this bottle of wine? And the Grand Reserva is sit down, have dinner, something serious. And I think the Reserva, you... You could do exactly the same, but I think it's much more kind of like, well, let's, let's just open this and drink it kind of bottle of yeah. wine. Yeah, I agree. We like to, what you said, you know, to educate people, like, we like that very much. And <clears throat> we do that. Eh? We, on the back label, on all our wines, you can see uh, the blend. Uh, you can see the amount of time that is, is aged in oak. You know, we like to, to put all of these because I think it's important for people to understand and what they're drinking, you know, and not to make the mistakes that that lady uh, had in, in your restaurant. If I buy a bottle of Marcus de Murrieta, I can see that, oh, this vintage was 8% Tempranillo, 12% Graciano, and then the other vintage was, seven, you know, 83% exactly. Tempranillo or whatever. And you can see what's happened and what's in the bottle. And I think that's, that's really good to have that information. Yeah. And I, then when I, you I, learn a little bit more that Tempranillo adds this to a wine, Mansuelo adds this to a wine, it gives you a good clue of what you're going to be drinking if you pick that particular bottle up. Thank you so much for your time. It's an absolute pleasure. And if I'm going to drink wine at half past 10 in the morning, these are the kind of bottles that we should be opening. So thank you ever so much. It's been an absolute pleasure. And, um, you know, when we can all start traveling again, we'll all have to get over to, uh, over to the, uh, the winery and come and visit. Marquez de Morgueta has always the doors open for, for everybody. And uh, please directly to me or through Adam MND uh, UK uh, organize a trip whenever you can and we'll be very honored to welcome you there so that was um Marcus de Murrieta um two really di uh, well you know so they've clearly got such similarity but there are some very obvious differences the color is is totally different um, they're, they're, they're both, I, I love both of them, but I, I think what's really worth saying is that, and we'll, we'll get on to pricing later, we, we don't like to go too soon on the pricing because obviously it, it changes your perspective of what the wine is. And, but I think that it, just to be fair to wine number four, we are comparing this side by side with a really expensive incredibly good wine from one of the top makers of Rioja who's just won the best wine in the world. Uh, actually, do you want to show there the, what's on their, their website? There's a best wine button there. There you go. That's, uh, it's not, not, not gloating about it or anything, but that's what their website looks like at the moment. Um, but um, we've got someone who's on the call who's actually bought a bottle of that. And uh, I think that we, we might be trying to find uh, some kind of a lockdown uh, excuse to- Staff training. To staff training exercise to, we'll to involve employing that, new yeah. people. But um, but yeah, it's uh, they've they've clearly done amazing well, and it's unfair to compare wine number four to wine number five like that. But it it does explain the difference between Reserva and Grand Reserva a bit. Absolutely, and there, there was a, there was a really good point in there as well about wine number five being a little bit young. 
Yeah. And it's the 2014 vintage, and, it, mm. and it absolutely is. 2014 is their newest release. Um, just all the 2013 yeah. and all the 2012 was was gone, so I didn't have an option to get hold of enough <laughs> of that to, uh, yeah. to to do the tasting. It's funny, so. when you're sending out wine for, and we've been, some of our wine tastings recently we've been doing for, for several thousand people, and uh, it's quite hard to get hold of that much of the same kind of these kinds of wines. Yeah, especially those boutique kind yeah. of things. And also so we can have some afterwards because we, you know, I could have maybe got a little bit of 2012 to do this tasting yeah. and then everyone goes, oh, I absolutely I love that. Yeah. Can I have some? I go, eh, no, you can have 14. But what's the point in doing that if you've not had to taste it, taste it live with and us? That, that's literally happened to us already on a, with a couple of wines, with the English ones in particular. But um, I... I, I, I uh, I think, like I say, it's a bit unfair to look at this wine number four on its own, um, uh, right next to this one. If you just drink this on its own, it is leagues above um, what what I, I've had from reserves and actually Grand Reserves from other producers. I think it's a really, really cracking wine, but and it's very well priced. But the uh, the, the wine number five, obviously, the quality just stands out for you, doesn't it? It is. It's 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 spectacular wine, and it's ex it's exactly what Rioja. And it's weird to say exactly what Rioja should be because mm. we, we've tasted five very very different wines, yeah. showing that there is that length and breadth of Rioja. But when you talk about what Rioja has classically been and what people expect from these big Rioja powerhouses, yeah. I don't think there's many people doing it better than Marcus de Morieta. And the history, you know, they they were the they were the first winery there in Longaro. In 1852, if my uh, my history is correct, and they're now, you know, a few hundred years later, still making. I think it was, wasn't it 19? Oh, I don't know. Anyway, the, the, it's pretty old, but still it's, making uh, yeah. the best wine in the world. Yeah, according to the Wine Spectator, who are one of the top publications, and um, yeah, I love this. Uh, I could do it with food. I could do it without food, and that's the nice thing about Rioja, isn't it? it even where they are on their grippier side compared to so many other wines around the world, Bordeaux in particular and Italian things. Mm. This it, is it, it's, this it's a line of probably better with food, but not undrinkable mm. without. There's some of those massive, massive wines, the you know, the Barolos of the world yeah. when they're young. You can't do it without food. It's just so tanning yeah. and so grip. This is just beautiful, but this you can have 10, 15, 20, 25 years out of this wine before you yeah. even need to look at it again. And because it's got this massive, rich fruit at the beginning, it's mm. got this beautiful cedar box spice. It's got a little bit of tertiary because bear in mind, you know, 2014, it's already yeah. seven years seven old. Years old yeah. um, but that's a baby for Grand Reserve, an absolute baby, because you know, you've got to bear in mind it's got to be at least five years old to get it out the door. So, yeah. you know, this and, is. And this every is now and then you'll, you'll see. Oh, no, I saw just before Christmas in, in my local supermarket a, a Grand Reserve that was, uh, what's that? I think it was 30 pounds. And that's. that's Crazy, crazy cheap for a Grand Reserve, and I, I bought a bottle of it. And honestly, it was just utterly disappointing. It, it wasn't much better than the Crianta from. It is, and I, th I think I mentioned producers. that interview. There, there's there's someone who's out there that they they make a Grand Reserve just because they've held yeah. it for another couple of years and not for that level. And I'm very very excited that mm. you've turned around and said, well, there's this and there's this. And there's that jump. And whether you feel that jump is worth the price increase, that's yeah, purely a personal thing. But there is definitely a difference between these two wines, <clears throat> and so there should be. So I mean, we've now come to the traditional point of the night. Obviously, we've got a few more questions, and actually, Caroline, we've got the laptop closed here because our internet connection was going a bit dodgy. So if there's anything spectacularly that we should solve, we, uh, we should talk about, um, do let us know. But solve. Solve, yeah, solve all your solve wine, wine problems. Mystery. I think people are largely planning wine tours. Okay, cool. Well, it, let let us come along because we, we, we want to go out and do some filming. And so if there's a few members of our live studio audience, fantastic. Yes. Um, we could do that, couldn't we? Do that. As long as we go on the 29th of June. Wine battle. Wine battle. Well, yes, your, your shirt's yeah. already the, the, well, I'm the, the right end colour, of day yeah, colour, aren't you? You have so you're to done. turn up in white. So yeah, it's all good. But um, uh, should we should we ask people what they think and then show them the prices, or shall we show them the prices and then ask them? Yeah. What I think we should do is let let's ask them. Yeah. Okay. Let's ask them, and if you want to take a moment to think about it, if you think the pricing might sway you, hold on for a couple. Yeah. Of hold moments. on. We'll leave it open. Yeah. Absolutely. So may, maybe answer your whether you thought it was wow, mayor, or whatever, but <laughs> then hold on on your favourite wine of the night until we've popped the prices up and see if those prices ah, 
That's make you change what idea. your favourite wine of the night is? Because that would be quite interesting. Yeah. So, Jamie, while, while people are voting on that, it, if we were going to have a look at this tasting journal and just pop it down in there, um, you can do things like alcohol based on um, you know, what it says on the label. And you can do typicity based on does this taste like what I would expect a Rioja to taste like. But, um, and, and complexity, I think, we've, we're starting to get into. We've, uh, those, especially those who've been on a few of these tastings. Um, it's, it's, you can understand you've got that mixture of fruit and oak and age flavours that come into it. But um, where would you put this on things like body? Wine number five. Yeah, wine number five. Let's because that's what you're it, drinking. It's the so, only thing yeah. I've got left. Yeah. So yeah. the body on this is is very full body. Yeah. It's got great fruit. It coats the palate. It's heavy. You feel mm -hmm. that weightiness. Good. Um, is that the right answer? I, well, I, no, I don't know. I'm, Alex I'm, says I'm right. Thank you very I'm, much, everybody. <laughs> if I'm wrong, please let us know in the chat. And length. That's all about how long the flavour lasts there in your mouth, isn't it? Absolutely. So you, ha you have that flavour, and it's good not. Length. <laughs> sometimes you get. There's sometimes a little touch of confusion with it because sometimes you get a nasty wine and it's yeah, kind of just okay. bitter and acidic and it just you, your mouth just <clears> like <throat> reacts to it. It doesn't taste nice. That doesn't mean it's got a long finish. No. The finish is about how long you can still taste the wine, not mm. the not the alcohol, not the acid, just the the flavour of the wine. And this you taste and it hangs like I, I've been talking for how long now and I can still taste the wine. Yeah. it's it's yeah, really too. really great long finish on mm. it. That's good. Um, and uh, structure is the other one that strikes me, and it, you know it's also it's one that I, I've I, I even wrote the glossary in the back of this where where we say that structure. Let me find it. So if you ever have a term that someone on one of these interviews uses, like someone said carbonic maceration earlier, so you can go and look up what carbonic maceration is in your glossary at the back of the book. And, and if it's not there, I'm going to make him write a second edition. No, yeah. <laughs> it is there. It's there absolutely. But structure. The combined effect a wine gives you that shows the intentions of the winemaker. And I, I went through all of this stuff, and I'm still not quite sure I get it. <laughs> it's all good. It's but, all yeah. good. Um, but the, stru the structure of the wine is kind of the, the different components and how they come together. So, you know, you've got that. It's all the kind of the fruit, the body, the complexity, and how it all kind of comes together. Is it... Oh, yeah. I'm going to say the B word again, aren't I? Balance, yeah. But, but also we, that, get that, that should be a drinking game. We should be... Every time Jamie <laughs> says balance, have a sip. Well, we'd, we'd be That's done fair, in five yeah. minutes, wouldn't we? Absolutely. Um, but, but it's also, it's, do you get that clear vision of what they were intending? Do you get that clear vision of, oh, I, I see they really wanted it to have these characteristics and they are coming through. And I'm mean, particularly with those wines two I'm and blind, three. I'm blind, so I'm going to go look at the scores. I get that. But uh, yeah, um, the scores are still coming in. But should we go and pop the... Uh... <laughs> this is very professional. Should we pop the prices up? And so now people can uh, who are waiting to vote on their, their favourite wine of the night. Yeah. So there we are, yeah. So these are some quite big boy wines that we've, we've, we've treated you tonight. And um, uh, I think that the salesmen from the, the wine companies, when, when they see us ordering these, these, these uh, crates worth of these wines, are, are having a happy day. But that's why they give us access to the, the winemakers. And um, they really hope that, you know, we, we are, it's worth saying, for those of you who've not been on one of these, we never accept any money or anything like that. He does accept shirts, though. We Send him a shirt. Shirts we If he wears your shirt, we'll send you something nice. Yeah. So um, I don't know if you remember to thank Ian on the last I did, the I last did, taste. yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah, he was in the credits, wasn't he? Was, he? Yeah. As Taylor's Taylor. Yeah. But send him a shirt. He'll wear it. I will wear it. How no matter how awful it is. But we don't. We don't. This is not an advertorial. It might feel like that, but we're actually, it's because we're presenting winemakers who we think are quite cool and we like them on a personal basis. So it is personal choices, predominantly by Jamie. And um, in apart fact, from almost when, apart always. from when Alex wins, and then he's well, in which case, that obviously. One. No, I, but but um, but these are not wines that we've been given free stock we go out and we buy them and we, we we choose them and we choose them fairly the only thing that it gives us any hint is whether they will let us talk to the people behind them absolutely because that's i think that's hugely important because yeah. to just listen to us for an hour and a half you'd be mm -hmm. you'd be done very quickly wouldn't you maybe should i let's quiz question, uh, quiz question. Quiz question. Quiz yes. Question. So put us out of our misery. So uh, uh, these the how many Hercules? Yeah. Well, should we start with how how many bottles of wine fit in one Hercules? Three hundred and sixty-five thousand. That that's quite a lot. Is so a lot. Anyway, so people people put, and I think the the number one answer was thirty-five thousand. Yes. Something. Like, I, I, I thirty-five thousand Hercules would be enough to put half the world's <laughs> wine production in. 
So it's a little bit smaller than that because these Hershey's are gigantuan. Yeah. So the answer we were looking for for Rioja, because they made about 350 million tons of grapes, which turns around to about 280 million bottles of wine, which turns around to about 700 Hercules. We didn't play with percentages, so please don't come back and say yeah. your maths is 723.69 Hercules. That I was did... the nearest one of those answers. But that yeah. was the nearest one of those answers. So and for those who got it, just you have had. You have... Well, I will congratulate you on your Herculean, Herculean. effort in your quiz. God. So Boom. yeah, that's that deserves it. But um, but are I there, really hope you've enjoyed. Are there it. any final, final questions, and questions, bits and pieces? And what were the favourites? What was the wine of the night? Well, just a summary. Yeah. Was there anything anyone? Hated? Did anyone boo too many wines? What got booed? Boo. Number two got booed. Number two got booed. Number three got booed. Boo. Number four got booed. No. But only by like. <laughs> Number five got booed, not by many people. Ah. Somebody wasn't enjoying the wines. Uh, but that's okay. lots and lots of people love them. Lots of people Good. love them, and that's, that's what we want but to see. But also. If you didn't love the wines, yeah. that's absolutely fine because we've experienced we this whole cross we learn, of Rioja. We taste, we try, yeah. and we go, guess what? That's not the wine for me. Mm. And hopefully, on the next tasting or the tasting after that, when we go to New Zealand next month or we go to Australia in March yeah. or we're in Chile and Eastern Europe in, um, in April, those are the things. And hopefully, we can find your, your next favourite. Quite right, quite right. And if, if none of those stood out for you and you thought, I really like that, then stick away from Rioja. <laughs> you don't need to waste any more time on it. But, um, but I'm delighted that the, what it looks like the absolute vast majority had a good time. And uh, I think Wine of the Night, it's looking very much. Very Murrieta ish. Like Murrieta Grand Reserve. It and is I looking think very Murrieta. And... But, but a strong performance from, from the Badiolas as well. And this is, this is, remember, this is the first set of wines they've put out under this this under this project absolutely so it's their first release um and i think it was mentioned the thing you know seven thousand bottles and they've got the capacity yeah. to go to you know they say double that sounds like a lot of wine but that's still only fifteen thousand bottles yeah, so it's quite. still going to be very cool small production but, but yeah well well, we, so uh, we've got we've got New Zealand next month. New Zealand. Then we're doing a bit of Australia. So the, tell us about that. So the Adventurer Series Australia tasting is going to be a little bit more specific. We're not just doing Australia, are we? Oh, so I'll, I'll do both. Let's 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 do New Zealand first because that's near. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So New Zealand, um, we've got we've got our discoveries for those of you who do both tasting. The discoveries we're just going to do a little tour of New Zealand, starting in Marlborough, going around about just to see where the different regions are. Mm -hmm. Then on the Discoverers, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be doing things that are a little bit different. So, for example, we're doing a Sauvignon Blanc, but we're doing the grey whacking. They use a wild yeast, so that's yeah. a little bit different. So it's going to be <laughs> some, smiling. some bits and pieces that, you know, either you've heard of or it's a great winemaker. And we're, we're talking with the guys at Wines of New Zealand to get us some yeah. really good content with some really cool uh, winemakers. Because New Zealand Wine Week is in February. Yep. So um, we're hoping to talk to some really, really, really cool people. Um, we're just lining that up because it's coming towards harvest time and we're just trying to make mm -hmm. sure we can get the right people. Then in Australia, once again, Discover us. We're going to do the tour. We're going to go all over, see what's going on. And then for our adventurous level, for you lovely, lovely people, we're going to do a deep dive into the Adelaide Super Zone. So we yeah. might look at Penfolds. We might look oh, at yes. Darenberg. We might do some, some Riesling from either Eden or Clare Valley. Um, so some really, really cool stuff there. Uh, moving on to April, Chile. Once again, yeah. we're going to see what the harvest happens and see what's around. Yeah. And then Eastern European wines will be the this yeah the birthplace uh, of winemaking. So I, 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 I'm, I'm quite looking forward to that. Um, that'll be really, really interesting, cool, and not uh, not as, as as challenging as you might expect these days. But but, but as always, if you've loved it, thank you very much. Yeah. Let us know. If it's not been perfect. Let us know as well. We're going to make it good. We're going to make it better. We're going to make it right. I can't fix his shirts, but outside <laughs> of that, we can fix anything else. But if uh, if that's it, I hope you've all had a wonderful evening, and we can probably do that. What, what they say at the end? Oh, um, roll. Roll credits. Oh, yeah, credits. <laughs>